Hi there and welcome to ibbusinessandmanagement.com I'm Mr Burton, I'll be running you through our third topic in this business organisation and environment um, section and today we're going to be looking at 1.3 organisational objectives and we're going to start looking at decision making which is a core role of management Remember, IP business and management management is a key key function and a core role of management decision making where are we now where do we want to be how do we get there and how do we know when we're there right. decision making a core function of management and we are going to need to come up with objectives organizational objectives have three key functions to control the direction of the business to motivate those people involved in the business and to direct operations within the business itself okay organizational objectives corporate objectives or strategic objectives are those objectives that are important broadly defined targets that a business much must reach in order to achieve its overall aim now the key functions of an organizational objective the first is to control objectives can help to control a firm's plan such as the department setting consistent targets with the rest of the organization so they they set the boundaries for business activity motivation Objectives can help to inspire managers and employees to reach a common goal. And direction. Objectives provide an agreed and clear focus or a sense of direction for all individuals and departments of an organisation. We've got different levels of objectives which we'll explore in more depth later. But we've got overall corporate objectives, individual department objectives and the workers employees within a department may have individual objectives and targets themselves right why are they important setting targets is essential in business without targets a business tends to have no clear, no clear sense of direction or purpose Okay, reasons for having aims and objectives. The first is that they serve to give a business a sense of direction, purpose or unity. So th this can help to unify and motivate management and workers. They form the foundation of decision making. Organisations can create strategies to achieve these goals. They can help to strategic thinking planning for the long term and they can provide a basis for measuring and controlling the performance of the workforce the management and the business as a whole mission statements now our definition for a mission statement is a declaration of an organization's overall purpose. Why is the business in existence? What's it doing? What does it want to achieve? And these mission f statements form the foundation for setting the objectives of a business. Vision statements. These tend to be more long term and aspirational. Here goes a great one. Apple ignited the personal computer revolution in the 1970s with the Apple II and reinvented the personal computer in the 1980s with the Macintosh. Apple was committed to bringing the, most, the best personal computing experience to students, educators, creative professionals and consumers around the world through its innovative hardware, software and internet offerings. BMW, a mission statement versus a vision statement. Mission statement to become the most successful premium manufacturer in the car industry. 
And remember, a vision statement is more long-term and more aspirational. BMW's vision statement, uniqueness through diversity, leadership, taking risk, courteous. Okay, the role of vision statements. Right, firstly, to have a clear purpose of what the business is trying to achieve. Outline the organization's values. States the underlying purpose of the business exist business's existence and serve to unify all people and corporate cultures within an organization. Right, aims and objectives. Important, important, important distinctions to be made here. Aims are the general long-term goals of an organization. Aims, general long-term goals of an organization. Objectives, short-term and specific. We can uh, quantify them, we can measure them, we can um, turn them into numbers and assess them. And when you are being asked these questions in the IB business and management exams think about the time scale and the specificity to be able to make that distinction so long term short term and how specific a goal or a target or an objective is and this will help you differentiate between whether we are focusing on an aim or an objective And we have short term and we have long term objectives. Short term objectives we refer to as being tactics. So short term methods firm can use to achieve their objectives. And long term is strategy. So tactics, short term, strategy, long term. And strategies are various methods that businesses can use to achieve their mission or their vision. They form the long-term plans for the whole organization. The strategy, how, uh, what do we want to achieve? Tactics, how are we going to get there? Right, different levels of strategy a business can adopt. Operational strategies or tactical strategies. These are the day-to-day -day methods for achieving what we would like. Okay, they're day-to-day -day methods used to improve the efficiency of an organization and they're generally aimed at trying to achieve the tactical objectives of a business. For example, a restaurant may investigate how to reduce customer waiting time without compromising the quality of its service. So you can see that's an operation strategy, tactical, and it comes down to day-to-day -to -day methods. Generic strategies affect the business as a whole. Uh, we'll have a look in detail a little bit later with, at Michael Porter's generic strategies and this looks at ways in which a business can gain a competitive advantage in order to meet its short term or medium term goals and the final level of strategy, corporate strategies are strategic long term objectives so for example a firm may aim for market dominance corporate strategy which may be achieved through a program of mergers and takeovers of rival in the industry which would be more um, strategic let's have a look in more detail now tactical objectives or operational objectives short term objectives that affect a segment of the organisation so we may be talking about a particular department we may be talking about um, a geographical um, region so for example uh, China Department uh, Indian Division now they set specific goals that guide the daily functioning of certain operations 
and an example here might be that the sales department uh, their their short term objective their tactical objective is to increase sales by 20% within the next year human resources perhaps their objective is to keep the staff turnover under 10% keep a hold of the qualified experienced staff stuff that you've trained up production ensure that product defects are under 0.05% all examples of operational objectives focused on a segment of the organization now short-term targets they can be monthly quarterly but no longer than this ideally annually quarterly six month or annual but no once they become longer we start talking about stru strategic objectives or our long-term aims the targets for the next few years our targets into the foreseeable future a typical strategic objectives may include profit maximization to grow the business enhance its image enhance its reputation improve its market standing and there are different hierarchy of objectives uh, starting from aims down to corporate objectives divisionable divisional objectives will help achieve corporate direction a uh, corporate objective sorry Department objectives will need to be sorted out to achieve divisional objectives and individual targets within department objectives will feed into individual department objectives. So you can see here there's a clear hierarchy of objectives with the bottom ones feeding into the ones higher up. So if we start here with the, an example, we're going to maximize shareholder value which is the typical typical objective a uh, company might have how are we going to do this we set a corporate objective to increase profits of all divisions by 10% a year so all the different product divisions we have whether that's shampoo um, deodorants soaps etc all these different um, divisions we're going to increase the profits of all divisions by 10% a year our divisional objectives within one region to increase market share by 10% and decrease overheads by 5% so we want to increase the revenues and decrease our costs within that division within that region within those divisions we'll have different departmental objectives helping to achieve our divisional objectives so for example finance may have the departmental objective to decrease long-term borrowing by 5% if we're able to decrease our borrowing we can reduce our interest costs and reduce our overall costs. Therefore, you can see feeding right up until maximizing shareholder value. Individual targets, perhaps uh, sales staff, their individual targets would be to increase sales by 5% per client. Increase sales by 5% per client. Increase revenues. And if we increase revenues, we might be able to increase profits. And if we can increase profit, there we are suddenly at our aim to maximize shareholder value so the hierarchy of objectives is is a very important thing to know to know the different levels of different objectives how they fit into an overall aim Show me. right important 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 these are all linked, right? You can s we saw that when we talked about the hierarchy of different objectives. Objectives flow from aims. Strategy flows from the corporate objectives. So, for example, aims state what an exa what an organisation wants. If, for example, to become the number one supplier of a product. The objective behind that aim may be to state what the organization needs to achieve in order to get what they want. 
So to become the number one supplier of a product, that aim, the objective, they need to increase market share. How can we increase market share? This is where we come up with our strategies. Strategies are the actions that facilitate an organization to meet its objectives. How can we increase market share? We can expand, we can tap into overseas markets. Now objectives don't have to be financial in nature, we can have ethical objectives. Ethics, moral principles that guide decision making and strategy. Uh, what we believe to be right, what we believe to be wrong. Here are some examples of ethical corporate objectives. Treating and, and paying your employees fairly. Reducing pollution by using environmentally friendly production process. Making sure your suppliers are happy by treating and paying fairly. So this is where the whole fair trade movement comes in. And treat your customers fairly. Don't rip them off. Don't offer a shonky product. Don't mistreat them. Ethical corporate objectives. Unethical behavior. Unfortunately, um, examples of this abound in, in the corporate world. You know, so many corporations, so many companies do great things, but when good companies go bad, boy, do they hit the headlines. Examples of unethical behavior. Are oh, there are a few here. We've got financial dishonesty. It just means that a business mismanages its finances, such as deliberate misrepresentation of its financial accounts. Now, this is illegal, not only unethical, but illegal. And there may also be moral issues, such as extravagant, extravagant business expenses being reimbursed to the directors of the, co of the company. Uh, bankers' bonuses would be a more recent example of financial dishonesty. Environmental neglect. Business activity is often associated with harmful consequences on the natural environment, so pollution, depletion of non-renewable resources. Exploitation of the workforce. Employers may mistreat staff, such as through deliberate neglect of employee welfare issues. For example, in 2006, Indian Airlines was heavily criticised for grounding female flight attendants for being too fat to travel. Can you imagine that, being too fat to travel? What an uproar there would be if that was, well, it wouldn't even be thought of in New Zealand. Uh, they were told to lose weight or risk losing their jobs. Unbelievable. On a larger scale, many multinationals have been criticised for the poor pay and working conditions offered to staff in less economically developed countries. And you can think of Nike and their sweatshops as a prime example there. Exploitation of suppliers, large businesses are able to take advantage of suppliers. So you can think about Walmart um, screwing down the prices that they're paying to their suppliers, just getting them as low, 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 squeezing every last um, cent from them, forcing them to cut prices. Now this is a controversial issue, especially when prices are not necessarily passed on to consumers or when the business exploits suppliers in developing countries. So you can think about the poor coffee farmers being taken advantage of by the nasty, nasty multinationals here. And we have exploitation of consumers as well. So firms may knowingly sell products that harm the welfare of people or society, such as tobacco, alcohol, gambling services and petrol. Uh, large firms with few if any competitors may charge excessive prices. This is why governments well, societies actually hate monopolies. And these examples are considered by most people to be controversial, if not unethical. Exploitation of consumers. You can think of the Chinese melamine milk scandal as well. Um, where that dodgy milk powder manufacturing company um, 
place to poison in their product to boost the protein contract uh boost the protein content that was showing up on their test and as a result um, a lot of babies died a lot of babies got disfigured had severe kidney problems ethical behavior advantages of ethical behavior if you are seen to be acting in an ethical manner um, you m you should hopefully get increased customer loyalty improve staff motivation and morale marketing opportunities and improve corporate image now Improve corporate image, acting in an ethical way such as treating employees fairly or being an environmentally friendly can help to enhance the image or reputation of a business. Um, perhaps more importantly, the media will report on unethical business behavior and this could seriously damage the image and reputation of an organization. Increase customer loyalty. Customers are more likely to be able to do, are more likely to be loyal to a business that does not act immorally. The Body Shop, for example, has built its large multinational customer base on its ethical policy of not testing any of its products on animals. Improved staff motivation is a big one, often ignored though, but it's big. Your staff provide the basis of a successful business. Now, ethical and moral behavior can be a driving force for improved employee motivation, productivity and loyalty. People are more likely to be proud of the business they work for if it acts ethically. And labour turnover will probably be lower, so less people are likely to leave the firm if the firm is socially responsibility, socially responsible, um, such as in being fair in the treatment of workers. Now, there are limitations to ethical behavior as well. Compliance costs, so potentially high costs of acting ethically. For example, organic agricultural products are far more expensive to harvest than genetically modified crops because of the additional time and money needed to produce organic food. Using recycled materials can actually be more costly than simply replacing them. Lower profits, lower profits. If the compliance costs cannot be passed on to the consumer in the form of higher prices, then it's likely that profitability is going to fall. This is an ethical dilemma for a business that exists when ethical decision making involves adopting a less profitable course of action. And there may be significant stakeholder conflict too. It's not necessarily the case that all stakeholders are keen on the business of adopting an ethical approach especially if it conflicts with other organizational objectives such as profit maximization. So speculative shareholders and financial investors, for instance, are more likely to be concerned with the short-term profits of a firm rather than its long-term ethical stance. Hence, managers may be pressured into pursuing goals other than ethical ones. And this is where a lot of the negative business practices come into play. Profit maximization, blinding managers to what is right, what is wrong. Run you through some examples now. Unethical treatment of workers. Um, let's have a look at Nike. My last stop and the home of Nike, the largest shoe manufacturer in the world. Nike chairman Phil Knight was named in my book as one of my favorite corporate crooks. Nike makes most of their shoes in Indonesia using teenage girls and paying them less than 40 cents an hour. The company has the backing of Indonesia's brutal military regime which has committed genocide in East Timor. Nike makes no shoes in America. When I arrived in Portland, I found the local citizens pretty upset about the situation. Oh, uh, Nike has sent in the uh, Portland police. Uh, officer, I wear a size uh, 11E. Thank you. Well, Michael Moore is my guest, and his new book is Downsize This. And let's go to Keith in, Keith in Nike. 
What, who's this? Keith Peters? That's me. That's Do you me. work for Nike, Keith? Yeah. Oh, okay. What's your question for Michael? Well, you know, I'm a big fan of Michael. I think the movie was great, and he spent a lot of time walking around Michigan looking for Roger. And I said, yeah, come on out. Really? Yeah. Is Phil there? Yeah. And he wants to see Michael? Yeah. Bingo! Whoa. Bingo! <laughs> Are you serious? I'm Is this serious. a prank? Come on out. We'll talk movies. We'll talk whatever you want to. Then stay tuned oh, because... Thanks, uh, thank you for the offer. <laughs> I couldn't believe the chairman of Nike was granting me a visit. I was met at the door by PR director Keith Peters, who warned me that Phil Knight's wife had given Phil my book as her wedding anniversary present to him, with his face circled. This was not the way I wanted to meet the first CEO willing to talk to me. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. Thanks for having me in here. Yeah, no, I, I got a little gift for you, because I always oh. come bearing gifts whenever I get to meet a CEO, which okay. I'll tell you isn't that often. You don't have to take too many gifts. All right, right? all right. No, no, no. This, this is a good one. You'll like this one. I've got here two tickets, one in my name and one in your name, for you and I to go to Indonesia together. All right? And you show me those factories. You explain this to me. Right? I'll well, show you what's going office? on Sunday. Oh, no, not a chance. Huh? Not a chance. No? No. But they're, they're transferable. I can change it to another day. No, I'll tell you. Seriously, look at this. Michael Moore, I got it right here in your name here. And no, Phil no, Knight. Phil Knight, look at this. You and me on Singapore Airlines. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going. It's a good airline. Yeah, it's a great airline. Here, sit back down. we got to negotiate right. this deal. All right, all right, all right. Now, have you been there? I've never been to Indonesia. You've never? Oh, you've got to go. No, no, I can't go between now and the rest of this year. Your wife. Remember the wife that gave you the book? My wife may make me go. Uh, so I won't tell her about it. <laughs> you should tell her. And Michael Moore came in there with a free ticket. This is a free ticket. No. Another anniversary present. It's a free ticket to Indonesia. <laughs> I understand that. You know, I mean, basically, you've got, uh, you know, an underdeveloped, country with a, a repressive regime and the way they pull themselves out of this thing is by having tra I think trade helps. That's a, a separate discussion from an American company going into Indonesia and, and, and working with a regime that killed 200,000 people. That's, a, that's almost a form of genocide. I, I know that that's got to bother you. I, I don't know you personally but I know you have a conscience. <laughs> Well, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't uh, approve of oh, any of that sort of thing. But basically, I mean, how many people were killed in the Cultural Revolution? How much is enough? You know, how much is enough? If 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 you are a billionaire, would it be okay just to be a half a billionaire? Wouldn't it be okay for your company to make a little less money if it meant providing some jobs here in this country? No, but but I mean, it's, 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 now just think about this. No, I thought about it a lot, and I give the answer that basically what drives me is not money. I'm not. I mean, I'm not interested right. for money anymore. I wouldn't think I so. Nothing. And basically what I want to do before I go to that great shoe factory in the sky is make this as good a company as I can make it. And I simply have a basic belief, having been burned on it once, and really believing this very strongly, so, that Americans do not want to make shoes. They don't want to make that's shoes. That's wrong. That isn't what their ambition is. If, if, I find, I if, I could find, uh, if I could find 500 people in Flint, Michigan who want to make shoes, I didn't say they want to make shoes. I think they don't want those jobs. <clears throat> no, if they do, if they will work those jobs, will you come to Flint? <laughs> Well, you'll have to convince me that they want to make shoes. Uh, if I can do that. And do so reasonably economically. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, they won't work for $5 a day. I understand that. But reasonably economically, without... I will, I, I will explore it. Mm -hmm. You will do that. I, will, I didn't say okay. I'd come. I said I'll explore it. You'll explore it. it. Seriously. With sincerity. With, With sincerity. sincerity. Well, I'll shake your hand for that. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Filmmaker Michael Moore is urging the world's largest athletic shoe company to open a factory. A factory in Flint. Michael Moore chastised the chairman of Nike, Philip Knight, criticizing the company for making most of its shoes in Indonesia. So Moore has come home to convince Knight. He's staging an event tomorrow in front of City Hall. So tomorrow at noon, I want to prove him wrong. Uh, I want uh, the people of Flint uh, who would like to work, who would like to have a job at Nike, to come here and stand in front of City Hall. I'll have my film crew here, dress warm, and uh, we'll make a video, a video message to him. Uh, and show him that the people of Flint, if they had an opportunity to work, would certainly work. We need jobs! 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 It's Nike. Uh, I'm 37 years old. For 25 years, I've been wearing Nike.
Nike means that much to me. Fletcher means that much to you. We don't make them here, we shouldn't buy them. There's a lot of people in Flint and all over Michigan that need jobs, but especially in Flint. And I'm one of those people. If I can buy my son these Air Jordans and he can wear them, you best believe I will help you make them. Come to Flint. <laughs> We're hard workers in this area. We've been working a long time. Five generations, four generations of hard workers putting cars together. We can put together your tennis shoe. Please give us a chance. Thank you. Very impressive. So what do you think? I think that a lot of people that don't have jobs will take any job, but that uh, given choice, that Americans really don't want to work in shoe factories. I still believe that. No, but I'm just... I'm just no, no, they said they did. Because, and, and I think any unemployed person will say that I would like any job. I mean, basically, you know, Flint isn't on our, on our radar screen right now as far as, as a warehouse or a, or a sales office. Um, would you do it as a personal favorite? I mean, <laughs> no. Phil swore he would never build a factory in Flint. But he did present me with the only American-made pair of Nike shoes, built just for me. I'll tell you what, how about, how about this? Why don't, why don't you and I have a race? No, we're not going to have a race. That we'll, was suggested we'll do, we'll do, already. No, we'll do a, now, how about this? We'll do a 100-yard dash, you and me, right? And, and, and if you win... Uh, I'll, I'll always wear these Nikes wherever I go, on every TV show, whatever. If I win, you have to build the shoe factory <laughs> in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> no, there's no race. How about arm wrestle? Come on. <laughs> no, I'm not going to arm we, wrestle. You we, would win that one. We are, no, 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 I'm not going to arm wrestle. Don't assume that. No, I'm not going to arm wrestle. If, if you win, if you win I'll, wear, no, I'll no, wear those Nike no, shoes forever. No, no, but if, if I win, then we're not you've got to make some so jobs no in Flint. <laughs> yeah, come on, come on, Phil. I issued Phil one last challenge, to contribute money to the schools of Flint. It's very unlikely that I would make a contribution to the Flint schools in the future. If I made the contribution, would you match me? Um, I'll contribute $10,000 to, to do that uh, for the Flint school system, if you'll do that. I will match you. You'll match me. I will. Well, yes. I'll shake your hand for that. Okay. Thank you very yes, much. you're welcome. All right. All right. Jeez, ten grand. Is all. <laughs> you made, you're, you're the your one stock that, went up $3 billion last yeah, year. Yeah, I got ten grand out of you. <laughs> well, hey, it's something, right? And I know what most of you are thinking. I sure would have liked to have seen that foot race. Well, maybe next movie. Meanwhile, back in my neck of the woods in the Midwest, there were And here we have Enron and a little clip just just scratching the surface of this highly, highly, highly unethical um California The first clues to Enron's new strategy hit California with a jolt. It started at noon, rolling across the state. Sacramento, San Francisco, Beverly Hills, Long Beach, San Diego. 26,000 miles of California power lines, enough to circle the earth. But for the second day in a row, not enough electricity for America's largest state and the world's sixth largest economy. California's deregulated system was a bizarre compromise between legislators and free market advocates. The rules were complicated and hard to follow. Inside Enron, California's system was little more than a joke. And once in place, Enron made sure that the joke would be on California. And I remember the conversation I had with Ken. At the end of it, he says, well, Dave, old buddy, let me just tell you. It doesn't matter, really, to us, what kooky rules you Californians put in place. I got a bunch of really smart people down there to figure out how to make money anyhow. One of the smartest guys at Enron was Tim Belden, who ran the West Coast Trading Desk. Tim Belden was a fervent believer in the idea of free markets, and as such, he spent hours poring over the new rules for the deregulation of California's energy industry, looking for loopholes that Enron could exploit to make money. He found plenty. After the bankruptcy, a confidential memo surfaced revealing the names of Belden's strategies to game the California market. Wheel out. Get shorty. Fat boy. Recently, audio tapes of the Enron traders were discovered. What do you want to call this project? Uh, I have a catchy name for that. <laughs> How about, you know, something friendly like Death Star? <laughs> <laughs> the tapes revealed Enron's contempt for any values except one, making money. Hey, John. Regulatory is all in a big 
concerned about is we're wheeling power out of California. He just steals money from California to the tune of a Can million. Can we rephrase that? Okay. He arbitrages the California market to the tune of a million bucks or two a day. <laughs> An arbitrage opportunity has been defined to me as any opportunity to make abnormal profit. So an abnormal profit would be um, returns above and beyond the norm. I was told that a good trader is a creative trader, and a creative trader is a trader that can find arbitrage opportunities. One of those opportunities was called ricochet. I'll see you guys. I'm taking mine to the desert. In the midst of the energy shortages, Enron traders started to export power out of the state. When prices soared, they brought it back in. So we fucking export like a motherfucker. Rich. To. Traders would stay after a 12-hour shift and pour over maps of the Western energy grid. What are the permutations and combinations of ways to move power around the West? And I think that that's something that Enron knew better than any other energy marketer in the country, period. We know all of the California imports. We know all of the California load. We're getting pretty spoiled on with this money. You said you were getting a little scared or making a little too much, and I, I tend to agree with you. <laughs> These are two traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S. This is what they say. What we did was overbook the transmission line we had the rights on and said to California Utilities, if you want to use the line, pay us. By the time they agreed to meet our price, rolling blackouts had already hit California and the price for electricity went through the roof. Did you have any knowledge that this was happening? The only, the only thing that I'm aware of, Senator, is there was, a, uh, there was a difference of opinion on the rules of the independent system operator. It was just set up. The rules okay. weren't quite, quite clear. We have traders here from Enron who were saying they did something wrong, but you don't see anything wrong. I have one last question and then I am done. Traders soon discovered that by shutting down power plants, they could create artificial shortages that would push prices even higher. Hey, uh, this is David up at Enron. Uh-huh. There's not much uh, demand for power at all. And we're, if we shut it down, could you bring it back up in three or four hours? Oh, yeah. Well, why don't you just go ahead and shut her down then, if that's okay? I want you guys to get a little creative okay. and come up with a reason to go down. Like a forced outage type thing. Right. Those guys, at the flip of a switch, could just yank the California economy on its leash whenever they wanted to, and they did it, and they did it, and they did it, and they made so much money. There would be ample supply available at the right fucking price. Oh, sure there would. It wasn't just Enron. Every company traded according to the, to the rules that California put up there. So we're the future of Enron. And we're fucking making half a billion dollars for Enron. Can you believe that? Yeah. We'll definitely retire by we're 30. And we're talking about a commodity that normally trades in the 35 to 45 dollar range. High prices are when it gets in the 50s for a thousand dollars. Prices aren't going to stay at a thousand bucks forever. If you weed out the weak people in the market, you know, get rid of them, and you know what? The people who are strong will stick around. And, and the Enron traders never seem to step back and say, wait, is what we're doing ethical? Is it in our best long-term interests? Does it help us if we totally rape California? Does that advance our goals of nationwide deregulation? Instead, they sought out every, every loophole they could in order to profit from California's misery. Temperatures in California are hitting higher than 100 degrees, fueling wildfires and fears that California's strained power grid could once again near collapse. What's happening? There's a fire under the core line. It's been derated from 45 to 2100. Burn, baby, burn. That's a beautiful thing. I was never comfortable on the trading floor at Enron. And if I had questions, I, I didn't ask them because I, I didn't want to know the answer. I, you know, I didn't want confirmed what, what I suspected might be true that what I was doing was, in fact, unseemly um, or was at least unethical, if, if not worse. Why did the traders do what they did? Was it their multi-million dollar bonuses? Or had Enron found a way to exploit the darker side of human behavior? 
Police officials want to know how a locally made baby milk powder became contaminated with a potentially deadly chemical. According to the state media, dozens of babies have developed kidney stones in recent days after being fed powder made by the Sun Lu Group. The company has now ordered a nationwide recall after its own test discovered the presence of melamine. That's the toxic chemical normally used to make plastics and was involved in a massive pet food recall in the United States last year. Back then, it was used to artificially boost protein levels. The first sick babies were reported in Gansu province on Wednesday, and since then, similar cases have appeared around the country. Chinese-made baby milk powder is not legally sold in the United States, but the FDA is concerned it may be available at ethnic Chinese grocery stores in cities with large Chinese communities like San Francisco, New York and Los Angeles. This is not the first time problems have been linked to Chinese-made baby milk powder. In 2004, at least a dozen babies died from malnutrition after being fed fake baby milk powder with no nutritional value. Officials, though, this time have been quick to act. State media reporting those responsible will be, quote, severely punished. John Bors, CNN Beijing. Responsibility. Now, there's a free market corporate social responsibility attitude and that it's up to governments, not businesses, to do what is um, beneficial for society and that an organisation is there to generate profits, um, to become efficient and prosperous, to create jobs and pay their company tax. And if they can focus on generating profits, becoming as efficient and as um, highly profitable as possible, create a lot of jobs, grow, create a lot of jobs, and then pay a great deal of company tax, then this is the best way to benefit society. The free market CSR attitude. And then we have the altruistic corporate social responsibility attitude. Now this view takes the opposite argument of the free market economist. Altruism refers to acting in a humanitarian and unselfish manner. These businesses do what they can to improve the society regardless of whether the actions help to increase their profits. So for example, such firms may be willing to donate money to charity or invest in local community projects. It can be difficult to determine in reality whether businesses help society due solely to altruism or because they believe such ac actions would help to improve their corporate image. Now that would be selfish. So humanitarian unselfish improve society really difficult to evaluate whether they are being altruistic or they just want the positive um, perception that comes from doing good and they should be doing this regardless of profit in fact doing doing what they're doing corporate social responsibility may be eating into their profits Uh, different views on corporate social responsibility. I'm just going to call it CSR from now on. Strategic CSR attitude. We should only do it if it will increase profits. Um, it, it's been shown that companies that engage that are, are very CSR have better long-term growth prospects than those that do not. Different cultures will have placed different values on CSR. Um, it comes down to a manager's decision in a lot of time how much the company will donate etc it's highly subjective and there can be several strategies of a profit-seeking company that chooses to adopt CSR and justification of your strategy a good HRM strategy Everybody likes to work for a company that's doing good out there. Marketing strategies. If you are seen to be social responsibility and your competitors are not, that's a great marketing opportunity. Finance strategies. Um, natural environment policies and external environment policies as well can all benefit from a CSR approach to doing business.
Um, the extent to which a firm will act in a socially responsible manner depends on a few different and these factors are listed here. Corporate culture and attitudes towards CSR. Consumer awareness of and concerns for CSR issues. Exposure and pressure from the media. And short term versus long term perspectives. So sometimes in the short term CSR practices can eat into profits. You know, higher costs to implement these things. But better long term prospects for companies that are socially responsible that are doing the right thing. Um, we have increased compliance costs and financial and human resources as well. Uh, social auditing, this is an important concept. It to ensure that socially responsible objectives are being implemented in the organization and importantly it's an independent assessment independent that means the company's not doing its own checks on its own CSR strategies so an independent assessment of how firms actions affect society and if it's not to do with society it's just to do with the environment then it's called an environmental audit and key um, the social Audits enable a firm to devise policies to deal with the impacts of its operations. So, i.e., implement its CSR policies. <coughs> High level topic here um, changes in corporate strategies over time, internal factors. Oh, so just backtrack. So changes in corporate strategies over time. We are looking at the many factors that affect the aims and objectives of an organization. And these can be both internal and external. Let's have a look at the internal factors. We've got corporate culture. So this refers to the accepted norms and customs of a business and its workforce. Businesses with a flexible and adaptable workforce are more likely to have varying objectives over time. Those that don't will keep the same objectives over time, e.g. profit maximization. Type and size, oh, the age of the business. Newly established firms will tend to place break-even and survival as the key objectives. You know, they just want to keep on top of the game, keep their head above water. Um, whereas more established businesses may strive for market leadership or corporate growth as their key objectives. Finance, the amount of finance will determine the scale of a firm's objectives. For example, if the objective is to expand into overseas markets, then the firm is going to likely need a huge sum of money to do so. And the type and size of the organization. So any change in the legal structure of a business is likely to cause a change in the organization's objectives. A sole trader that expands into a partnership will need to consider the objectives of other owners of the new business. If there is a separation of ownership and control, such as in public limited companies, then there may be a conflict of interest. For example here, managerial objectives such as higher bonuses may clash with the objectives of the owners such as higher profits. Risk profile of key stakeholders. Now, if managers and owners, for example, have a relatively high willingness and ability to take risk, then more ambitious ob objectives are likely to be sought after. And external factors that affect the objectives of a business include the state of the economy. When the economy is in a boom or a, s a slump, whether the economy is in a boom or a slump will also change corporate objectives. Booms, times of national income and employment are rising provide many opportunities for businesses. Whereas slump when slumps when unemployment is high and confidence levels are dampened provide many threats. Although it saying that during a slump, a depression, a recession, uh, your competitors would be absolutely struggling, so it might be a great chance great opportunity to take advantage of their painful position. 
Government constraints. Some government rules and regulations can limit what a business might strive to achieve. So, for example, environmental protection laws may limit the extent to which a firm can maximise profit due to the potentially higher cost of being environmentally friendly. It costs a firm extra money to deal with their waste and byproducts in a responsible manner than just to dump it in a stream. And the presence of power and power of pressure groups that are in operation also affect objectives of a business. So pressure groups may force a business to review its approach to ethics through their lobbying. Pressure groups may harm a firm's image if it is not adopting a socially responsible approach to conducting business. And society's expectations of business behaviour change over time as well. So what was once considered acceptable by society such as smacking or caning disruptive students in school may no longer be the case. Environmental protection was not a major issue prior to the 1980s, now it is, thankfully. Many countries don't think it's necessary to impose a national minimum wage, whilst most developed nations would think that this is quite necessary. So the, the key point being here that CSR is rather subjective. What's considered right or wrong is largely based on public opinion, and public opinion has the tendency to change over time. Now remember that a performance of a business can be judged largely to the extent that it can meet its objectives. Right. Effective business objectives usually meet the following SMART criteria. So specific objectives should focus on what the business does and should apply directly to that business. For example, a hotel may set an objective of 75% bed occupancy over the winter period. This objective is specific to the business. Objectives should be measurable. Objectives that have a quantitative value are likely to prove to be more effective targets for directors and staff to work towards. For example, to increase sales in the southeast region by 15% this year. Measurable. And you know what you're aiming for. Agreed or achievable, objectives must be achievable. Setting objectives that are almost impossible to achieve in a given time will be pointless. It's just going to demotivate your staff who have the task of trying to reach these impossible targets. Realistic or relevant, objectives should be realistic when compared with the resources of the company and should be expressed in terms relevant to the people who have to carry them out. For example, Informing a factory cleaner about increasing market share is less relevant than the target of reducing usage of cleaning materials by 20%. Make it realistic, make it relevant, and finally make it time specific. A time limit should be set when an objective is established, for example, by when does the business expect to increase profits by 5%. Without a time limit it will be impossible to assess whether the objective has actually been met.